supernatural is something that isn't supposed to happen, but it does happen. And no nation which expects to be the leader of other nations can expect to stay behind in this race for space. you that the dead do not always rest in peace. Brott's Beard Care is a proud sponsor of the Three Beards podcast. Go to brottsbeardcare.com, enter promo code Three Beards with a capital B, and you're going to get 20% off your order. We have with us tonight Gary Wayne, a Christian contrarian whose lifelong study of the biblical prophecies, mythology, history, has led up to the writing of the book, The Genesis 6 Conspiracy, How Secret Societies and the Descendants of Giants Plan to Enslave Humankind. I've got this book, if you can see it. <laughs> I'm not a professional video person here, anyway. And that, no. bang, was my, <laughs> and that bang was my phone. <laughs> God. Yeah, like I said, this is what you're getting into, sir. So welcome to the show, Mr. Gary Way, and how are you tonight? I am uh, doing just fine and so happy to, to be with you tonight and uh, really looking forward to the conversation and hopefully creating some curiosity and some areas for people to maybe look further into that they haven't looked into before because I think what we're going to be talking about is going to absolutely fascinate some people. Yeah. And we're oh, happy to have you. Yeah, yes. yeah de definitely. I mean, thank you for having here. I mean, we talked about a few of these topics I mean, right before the show, you know, I mentioned it to you, you know, and I, but I just, I want to start off with just, you know, when this came in the thing, I was not, when I ordered this, I was not expecting 800 pages <laughs> of work. I, I was, I was expecting, you know, like you're, you're tip, when you typically get a conspiracy novel, so, you know, book about it, sorry, use word novels, no, no, when you usually get a conspiracy thing, you know, you, it's usually like the size of, you know, that's, it's, it's usually 80 to 100, you know, 100 and some pages. I get 800 pages. I'm like, I just bought a Graham, you know, Hancock, you know, si you know size novel. Exactly. I go, yeah. This this man has done some research. This is not some just throwing stuff together because you don't come up with 800 pages of just, you know, gibberish and throw it in chapters. And it, so for anybody, I got this off Amazon. I should know Amazon anybody can go to. Yeah, you can go to genesis6conspiracy.com. He um, Gary has links up there for Amazon, Barnes and Noble, and also a Kindle version. And if you were somebody like myself who you know who apparently looks at these things after the fact, I could have ordered a signed copy what? by clicking a link. But no, I just decided to just order it first before actually going to his site. So if you want to not make my mistake and do it <laughs> the right, you know, a cool way, go to his site. Genesis6Conspiracy.com and get a signed copy. So did I miss anything on that, sir? <laughs> no, thank you for the, the generous intro, introduction. And so I personally signed it. So if you want it customized in any way, then just put it on the, on the order if you want a signed copy. But you can link through okay. the website to Amazon.ca, Barnes & Noble, Dot, dot com amazon.com and to the kindle version so uh, i'm a little bit more money because my contract doesn't permit me to undercut the retailer so mine's the straight retail price plus shipping but it will be a signed copy and it was interesting when you're talking about the size of the book and you know two things on that i'd like to point out and i don't want to scare anybody off but i i edited it out almost 400 pages, so 350 to 375 pages, because <laughs> I wanted to get it down yeah. to a size that people might read, or uh, and would How long did it take you to, to write that? Oh, uh, well, I started researching in 1980, but I didn't really get into this aspect for, as it turned into a conspiracy book until about 1997, and I finished it mm -hmm. about 2013, and it took me a couple of years to sell it and get published. And the other interesting thing about it is, 
there's over there's over 120 pages of endnotes so you'll know where all my sources are coming from and the bibliography yeah. is very very impressive and you may you know just buying the bibliography is worth the price because there's so many good books that I use for reference in there and each chapter is loaded with information every line is loaded with information there's no filler in there it's facts <laughs> information facts information all the way through so i would advise people if not to speed read it because you might pop some brain cells and uh, just read it as as you can digest it and every chapter is written as a mini story that leads into the next chapter and then we'll keep coming up as the book progresses. But it's also designed that you can move forward and backwards and read those little mini stories just on topics that you might be interested in. So just a Craig, kind of visual Craig. representation for people. I took out, this is the bibliography part that he was talking about. This is the beginning part with like the chapter list. This is all the information in the book. So I mean, there, there are, like I said, there, it, most of this stuff, I'm just, it was impressive. That's all I can say, I just impressive. So, but I, this with the size of the book i was like we have an hour so i was like trying to figure out how to scope this one um to just you know obviously you're busy you do a lot of these things so if we go if we can't get if we looks like we're going to run out of time we can't would you mind coming back at a later date for a like a follow-up one oh absolutely that's generally what yeah. happens is because there's so much so many topics and so many interesting things trying to get it all into one show just sort of skims the surface so absolutely if yeah, your audience I, likes what they hear invite me back anytime all right well hey, i appreciate appreciate that because i so we'll start kind of i mean let's well I mean, you know it's our i'm gonna i feel like i'm plagiarizing here we'll start in the in the beginning <laughs> i created the heavens in here yeah we'll start at the beginning here yeah so <laughs> yeah so we we have now you know the garden of eden we're, we're getting into, and this is kind of where I, I mentioned a little bit, you know, prior, you know, prior to the show, you know, where I'm kind of gone to the Gnostic side a little bit to me was one through growing up. This was never discussed because here you have Adam and Eve, Garden of Eden, the serpent comes, you know, tempts Eve, and now they're cast out. Now we get to the story of, you know, the family, you know, Cain and Abel, Cain goes off. And this is where it's fascinating is that nothing is from this point is really when I was growing up was never mentioned is where did King go? And obviously he's not out there alone, suddenly spontaneously, you know, you know, spawning off pieces of him, you know, and creating. So he goes to, so there's obviously something else out there that he goes to. And that, and that's kind of where I like your book because your book kind of starts to fill in some of those pieces I've always asked. Yeah, it's, it, and so that, again, people sort of understand is I classify myself as a Christian contrarian. So I don't generally accept standard dogma or what somebody says, something says. I verify it myself, and I, I apply that to the Bible as well. And so you cannot go through the Bible and uh, understand what seems to be contradictions, which really aren't, if you're filled with standard dogma brainwashing and so you need to be able to verify things and so uh, the standard dogma is is that somehow Cain takes uh, a wife in a place that's already named Nod and builds a city for who and takes a wife very quickly and has Enoch which is a very important figure um, on both sides of the equation, Gnosticism and some of the polytheist religions and monotheism. But there's two Enochs, which I'm probably jumping a little bit ahead, but he names the city after, after his son Enoch, and some people pronounce it Hanok. Um, and there's a lot of other transliterations for Enoch in all sorts of different color, uh, cultures, from Idris to Thoth to all sorts of different names for him. So he's, he's, he has a place in, in a lot of cultures. But the question gets to be you know, how how can that happen because our understanding at this point in time there's just adam eve cain and abel's been murdered mm -hmm. right yeah and yeah, he takes a wife right and so 
if we look a little bit further into Genesis, we find that Adam, when he's 130 years old, is going to have Seth, and he's going to have other sons and daughters, and Seth and Cain are going to have some siblings, and Cain has been ostracized by this point. But if we go back to the offerings that start the domino effect to the killing of Abel and then the ostracizing of Abel, uh, we have an interesting concept where what's really going on here with these two young people is they're doing first fruit offerings that's talked about in the law of Israel. And because Cain didn't provide a first fruit, his offering isn't, um, is, is, isn't acceptable. And that's when uh, Abel gets favored. Cain, out of revenge, kills uh, Abel and then has to leave. And so when we, when we start to look at that and we understand that they were quite young, Cain, uh, Cain will not have another sibling until Adam is 130 years old. So there's a gap there, right? And so where does his wife a come long from? long time. <clears throat> yeah, contradiction. The thing is, is that the day six account is completely different than the Eden account in its chronology, in how it's created, and a whole bunch of details. And, you know, everything that... In Eden, Adam is created singular. Sometime later, we don't know how long afterwards, Eve is created. But in day six, they're created male and female in plural and told to span out all across the earth and settle the earth. But Eve, Adam is in Eden and he doesn't span out across the earth until after the serpent account that you're talking about, the cash account. And so, that's just one of many details, and there's and I've got a document for people if you want to know the differences, and I have a chart for it as well of all the different details between the day six account and the Eden account. I lay that out because I don't think that you can understand scripture by ignoring inconvenient details because if it's the word of God, it's going to have to fit. So the only way you can account for these things, and I'm just sort of summarizing, and the book will go through a lot of this in, in, in detail as we go out through the book, is that there are two different creation accounts. Sometime after day seven, and, and you look at the chronology, I mean, it happens after the Sabbath is created on the day of rest, or a thousand years, depending on how long a day is. And then you have Eden created and Adam created sometime later. So the only way you can really say from a Christian perspective and, and, and resolve the contradictions is there has to be two different creations. And then all of a sudden, a ton of other things start to make sense in the Bible. So that would be the first uh, sort of thing to answer your question. That was a long answer, but I thought I should walk sort of people through it. And they'll get an understanding that I'm a contrarian. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and that's, well, that's kind of what I, I was hoping for, too. And I've mentioned this to people because one of the stories, I noticed it's in one of the later chapters, too. You have it on Lilith. You know, we brought that up before. And as I'm doing research, she is said to have been Adam's, you know, first. First one. You know, and then because she refused to submit you know, and do that, you know, the way that it was laid out, she was cast out and that she is actually one of the key figures in this society that Cain ends up going to and creating in this. And that's where I was wanting to get into that too, you know, like your thoughts on where, because I haven't, I, I, I won't lie. I haven't got to that part of the book yet. I started reading, and, but I, I'm not, I'm not there yet. <laughs> sure. And uh, I cover off Lilith and other uh, religious beliefs in terms of Cain and creation as we go throughout the book and in particularly with with Lilith. That is a, a Kabbalistic uh, part of the mystical part of the Jewish tradition as opposed to the Essenic part, although they will have similar traditions, but they won't have that Eastern Mesopotamian uh, influence to it. And that comes back with uh, the Judeans after the exile in Babylon, that starts to enter into the Jewish mystical part. And a lot of that starts to enter in what they learned in Babylon in exile. It was King Nebuchadnezzar who 
uh, conquered uh, the southern kingdom and took them off to Babylon for about 70 years, are the serpent seed doctrine as well, which is a significant doctrine of Gnosticism in terms of not uh, that Eve was seduced by the serpent who is actually either Satan or one of other uh, rebellious angels. And there's the several different accounts, but Satan is sort of the standard one. And that becomes part of and that's actually in the Targum, which is the oral tradition and the rabbi commentary on the Bible as they lose their Hebrew language in day-to-day -day life while in Babylon and, Ar and Aramaic comes in. And they have to start translating from Hebrew, which the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the Essenes still understood. But to teach what was in the Bible, they had to translate into Aramaic. Uh, Aramaic, and they develop commentaries at that point in time, and that's where the target comes from, and they have that serpent seed doctrine in it as well, and it comes in at the same time. So my view on it is that Lilith is uh, a character that comes out of antediluvian Sumeria for the flood, and it's actually created by the gods, and is either a lower god, created from the parent gods, or a demigod, which would be a uh, human hybrid or an Anunnaki, earthly Anunnaki, using the terminology of Sumeria as opposed to Nephilim out of the Bible uh, or Rephaim after the flood. And so she comes out of that pantheon in history. And I don't have a doubt of the validity of who Lilith is as, as she is recorded and not recorded very kindly in any culture. Um, but she is at the source of the dragon bloodlines as well as an offspring of Tiamat. No, right? And Tiamat is from yeah, the parent gods. Yeah, and I was, you know, it's kind of, I mean, was that intentional that she is just basically written off? It's like, you know, I don't, you know, no record of her is to be written down. I mean, because there's very little official documentation, you know, about her other than just these yeah. glance, well, you know, note. In, in all cultures, uh, in all polytheist cultures, you have a rebellion by the lower or offspring gods. So in this case, Tiamat and Alu, her consort, are part of the Sumerian pantheon with Anu and the, usually there's a dozen of those parent gods. And to give people a reference if, they're not, if they don't understand the Sumerian pantheon, uh, in the Greek pantheon, you had the parent gods that had Kronos and Gaia as male and female, and and again, 10 other parent gods, and their offspring gods would be the Olympian gods, which would be Zeus and Poseidon and that whole host of gods. Now, moving that back to Samaria, you have Enki and Enlil as being sort of offspring gods as well, right? Mm -hmm. As well as where Lilith would fit in either there or one notch below, and it's not real clear whether or not to me that she was created from total of the gods or a combination, let's say, like Gilgamesh was created, or up in a Pishtun, where there are two-thirds God and one-third human, according to the Epic of Gilgamesh, and offspring of the gods, both before and after the flood. So up, up in a Pishtun would have been uh, a giant that was on the Ark in, 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 in their epic and survives the flood, but Gilgamesh is sort of a second incursion after the flood, as is Anakedon, who is created to offset the evilness of, of Gilgamesh as that sort of epic goes. So what happens is that in all the cultures, that second-tier gods overthrows the top-tier gods. So Zeus or Zeus, depending on how you want to pronounce that, would move to the top in uh, the uh, Greek pantheon. And then gods like Enlil and Anki move to the top in that rebellion in the Sumerian pantheon. And that happens in all polytheist cultures around the world. Interesting. It's kind of in, you know, and that was one of those things, like I was trying to frame this, I, you know, I knew that I had so many questions, like, you know, the ways we can go, I mean, just, because I've always been really fascinated with the passage, like, out of the Bible, well, as I was growing up, you, you know, every, I mean, what kid didn't like the story of Revelation, you know, all the, you know, you get to read all the stories, you know, everything, just those were the ones that were exciting, you know, Exodus was boring, I mean, you're just like, how fast can I flip through this page, you know, this, this wasn't, you know, but then as you go through there, you know, you see these stuff 
and this is one of the tenets. I mean, this is kind of jumping forward, and then we'll come back. You know, the Nephilim or Nephilim are said to have been sons of God. You know, angels in some accounts. You know, they where they came down, found the female form. You know, enticing, impregnated, produced their you know the race, which became this one. And the main, one of the main questions I wanted to ask you in the beginning was, what do you think is the biggest whole part that holds back a lot of Christian believers that they're not willing to accept that account from you, but they're willing just readily the main one that everybody believes in, the virgin birth of Jesus Christ, that an angel of the Lord came to Mary, yeah. and that is an acceptable one. You know, that is the full doctrine, but this one is, yeah, very crazy. We can't, you know, yeah, the, I can't believe this. Well, it's 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 uh, inconsistent with the concept that the Bible is the most supernatural book in the world. I mean, there are just so many supernatural <laughs> things that are going on in there. Um, so, but what happens in most Christian denominations, Catholic or Protestant, is that about... 200 years maybe a little bit more seminary schools were being uh dominated by a different group and you can you can make an argument that's a gnostic or polytheist um infiltration or it is just the powers of the organization within christianity um both in catholicism and protestantism wanting to change the doctrine to dumb people down and not talk about uh, either inconvenient things or things that they're just trying to keep uh, hidden from people because they don't think that they can handle it. Because when you start to understand who the giants are, you start to have to ask some very, very serious questions. So the easiest thing is to say is that the sons of God that's talked about in Genesis 6 are Sethites, uh, whom we talked mm -hmm. about previous, which is the uh, son that's born after is ostracized and and when adam is 130 years old and that these weren't really giants that they were it's just an exaggeration because when you do that then you don't have to deal with well what the heck were giants doing in genesis and how do all of these giants show up after the flood again and why are there so many different names to the giants so if you take giant back to hebrew that's the word nephil and i am is the male plural so they were the giant ones, the tyrant ones, just as seraphim is a serpent-faced fiery angel and are the serpent ones, right? They're the ones who look after government and religion in the angelic hierarchy, both on the rebellious side and on the, on the loyal side. And that's why you have so much serpent imagery around the world for the gods and for the royal families. And it's these giants that... Um, that are being talked about, the Nephilim and the Rephaim, as they're called after the flood, also names people can't take back to the table of nations because they don't come out of the table of nations, are names like the Avim, or the Horim, or the Hivim, or the, uh, uh, or the uh, Zamzuzim, and on and on and on. There's just all of these, the Malachim, there are just so many different names that are listed, and they're all considered Rephaim after the flood. And again, you get that contradiction. Okay, well, there was a flood, so if the giants were wiped out by the flood, how did they show up after the flood? I'm not going to go down that rabbit hole yet, but if you want me to come back to that, I, I will. But what happens with these giants is they usurp the kingships in the antediluvian world, and then again afterwards. So they start the royal families. They create the nobility class. And monarchs take their genealogies and track them back to the Nephilim, and the Raphaim even to this day, because it helps where they fit in that culture of pure bloods. The pure and more ennobled or scion bloodlines in, the higher they are in, in, the, in, in the hierarchy. And what's uh, interesting about understanding that aspect of the giants is that uh, you have an understanding then that somehow you have a rebellion that are looked upon as gods in the polytheist world, whereas those wow. people who believe in polytheism would look at those gods as 
good gods for the most part. And there's a duality in that Gnosticism, as you understand, of good versus evil within that. But these are the same beings that are the heroes of Greek mythology. Pleasant Poseidon, who creates the offspring with uh, Clito or Clymene or Iapetus has the same version, so depending on which one that you're reading, who create the ten hero kings of the Atlantean Empire of the ancient world that Plato talks about in Critias and Timaeus. And these are the Miosi of China from the dragon creator kings. These are the Azuras of the, and the Datria of the subcontinent of India. These are the Zabalba of the Kishimaya. And they're created in this form of Nephilim, and there are different kinds of giants in terms of how they look, because they look like their fathers. Um, these are the gods that are known around the world as the Nagas, or the dragon creators, or the Anunnaki serpent gods from heaven, or the feathered serpent and plume serpent. I don't want more everybody with naming every oh, no. one of them oh, around yeah. the world, but you kind of get that, get that idea. So if you're going to release this information onto Christianity even today, you're going to get a big pushback because they're told those weren't uh, those weren't angels. Those were Sethites who mated with the daughters of humans that created an exaggerated, taller individual. But the thing is, you have the same identical story in every culture on every continent around the world that tells the same story yeah. as Genesis 6. And the flood is related to that creation when those uh, kings, uh, demigods, turn evil, that the gods come together in the polytheist version to bring about the flood as more of a series of cataclysmic events as opposed to a single flood. Okay, I think you're touching on something I had a question about of my knowledge of the Bible. It said um, in one verse that the Nephilim were one of the main causes for the flood, but I've never been yeah. able to find out why. Um, so what in your research throughout your history, why was the Nephilim one of the biggest cause for the flood? So we don't get a reason for that directly connected in the Bible. What we do get is in Genesis 6, where you have verses 1 through 4, where you have the creation of these giants. That's the preamble to the flood story. Right? There's nothing to separate it. <laughs> Begins in chapter 6, right after the Nephilim creation account. Noah's inter introduced after his genealogy that ends after 5, and you go right into the flood story, because the world has become violent. But we're not told any more than that. We get very, very stingy information. But when you start to match that up with all the parallel accounts around the world, and all those different cultures, they have a consistent story is that these demigods who are ruling as the divine right to rule by the gods as being a hybrid a god, a demigod is by definition the offspring in the ancient world that was known as the offspring of a god and a human female. And that's where the term demigod comes from. And so if we understand that, that they're the divine representative, the liaison between heaven and earth before the flood and then again after the flood, uh, then you, you get an understanding that they controlled all of the kingdoms and they set up their dynasties. The thing is, uh, particularly, I think it's described best in, um, in Plato's account in Timaeus and Critias, is that the human side starts to take hold of the god side and starts to contaminate it like a virus. And so all the sinful nature of humans starts to dominate, and these uh, demigods become uh, vicious, violent, um, human-eating, drug-drinking monsters, right? And you also got them warring between themselves because there's rivals. And so when you have Hercules, for example, or Theseus fighting in the war against uh, Atlantis, you've got giants Hello. fighting against giants, right? So you have this a good sort of evil sort of aspect about it. But then all of a sudden you understand that, wait a minute, these giants had control and they set up the dynasties and we get a similar thing that again happens after the flood. So if you don't want people who are educated uh, trying to ask questions about who these royal bloodlines actually are and what they believe, you got to dumb that down. 
Now, is that part of, do you think that's part of the reason why we don't have a lot of accounts from this time, this time period? Because, I mean, that's what I said, there's very little written about this. I mean, to me, this is one of those things where you think there'd be people documenting this, you know, in detail. Because, I mean, we have down in through the Bible, you have more, you know, the battles of Joshua with Moses. Yep. You have all these d more details where, like this, there's very little that's, there's you very know, very little, yeah. yes. And that could be for a number of reasons. Number one, if you have a worldwide catastrophe, everything gets wiped out. And so mm -hmm. as, as Plato talks about with Solon, as he's getting the information from the priests, is that um, these, this destruction was done so that people would forget and not remember and not have a record of the past. And so if you then overlay the idea, and of course I show in the Bible in the Atlantis chapter, biblical chapters uh, or citations where this destruction was more than just a flood. If uh, it was in fact um, asteroids hitting the water, which is uh, a common an account in polytheism that starts the cataclysms and you had volcanoes and you had earthquakes on almost an extinction like event, except that um, the, the only thing that survives are the people on the ark or climb to a mountain, depending on which version that you're looking at for survival stories and for the uh, many of the fish that are in the sea, then you can appreciate and understand why you have all of these underground cities off the coast of yeah. India or Southeast Asia or in the Caribbean that don't fit into even secular history's chronology of history well, and are and totally apologize. unaccounted for. Yeah, and apologize if, if it is in the book, and I haven't got to this one yet, but um, I'll just throw the question out there. It's one of the things that I've um, routinely thought, you have Hitler, you have other things that were, are absolutely fascinated with Antarctica. Yeah. The rumor is, you know, when Admiral Byrd went down there, they went down with what they call an explorer, you know, a force, yep. you know, which was in any account was a full scale military, you know, operation to go down there. And I've wondered was it, cause some of the, <clears throat> excuse me, but some of the podcasts I, I've listened to prior to you, there's always many people ask like, where'd the giants go? Did they just disappear? Did they go away? And I, this is one of the things, do you think maybe that, this rumor thing, like what Hitler was looking for, what everything is, that there might be something to do with this race. The Raphaim, like you said, made it down there, and they're, you know, that's where they're held up. Yeah, well, you know, when we, t when we talk about Antarctica, we can only really speculate because mm -hmm. only um, high-powered individuals have been able to go there. Uh, there's been increasing travel there from world leaders and very, very wealthy people. Um, what we're told is that whatever is there is going to turn over most of the world's preconceived understanding of history, who we are, and is going to change things significantly. So a anywhere from alien races, alien bases, to uh, pyramids, to incredible knowledge and technology that was uh, uh, kept there under all of the ice since the uh, since the flood probably uh, but mm -hmm. probably even before that but that's another rabbit hole uh, and <laughs> a common <laughs> a common uh, thought is that Nephilim or Raphaim or both were kept in stasis uh, and helped out by the gods or the rebellious angels, depending on how you're coming from, or if you're part of the ancient alien mythos, then these very advanced aliens. But they all tell the same story. And they all are, you know, you, you get versions coming out of each of those sort of not polarities, because mm -hmm. there's three different sort of levels to that, and even more, all talking about the same thing. So something's going on down there. They're going to reveal it. But the question was, do I think that there's enough and stasis there. It's certainly possible. And we get out of Gnostic accounts and many polytheist accounts how the gods helped the Nephilim survive. 
right? So whether or not it's the Epic of Gilgamesh, right? Or it's Deucalion yep. and Pyrrha in the Greek mythology and understand Deucalion is the offspring of Prometheus. So whether or not Prometheus is Nephilim or a god, and there's two accounts of them, um, then it doesn't really matter. Deucalion is Nephilim. He's a hero, right? He's one of the Titans. He's the demigod. And so that survival story, and they get helped by the gods. And so, and you also have other accounts like Amaka Seth in Gnosticism, who was created in a cloud, which is different than the other giants in Gnosticism that are created, but he's also spared by the gods to be replanted again at Sodom, which Gomorrah was the original plantation or planting of that giant race before the flood. And which again is really interesting because Sodom is so close to Mount Hermon where the giants were created at least in the Enoch version. Um, so you, you get these other accounts where the angels, the fallen angels or the gods were helping the giants to survive. I personally think that's my second position. Uh, my favorite position is a second incursion that the Rephaim are recreated after the flood in a second incursion, just as um, Gilgamesh and then Akedna are in the Epic of Gilgamesh. And that it either happens at Sodom or at Mount Hermon. I can make a good case for both, but it also means that there could have been more than one place of giant creation because it would have happened several times, just as Genesis 6 talks about, that the sons of God went to daughters of human again afterwards. We're just not told how many times and whether or not that includes the flood or not. It's a little bit opaque. And so <coughs> I think that where I'm going with this is that you could have had that recreation after the flood or you, which is this, my second position because we don't get scripture for exactly how they show up, only that they do, is that perhaps they survived the flood with the God's help. That's, that could include stasis. Yeah. Yeah, no, um, I'm just trying to remember. There's, there's one of those things I got. I was, there's so many things that you brought up. I'm just like, it, you know, I'm just <laughs> it, the one. Well, I, I'll go here before I get too lost in my own thoughts here. The, like in several of your interviews, and one of the things that I yep. really liked too is where it's not so much that the Bi Bible says, you know, a third of the angels rebelled. Well, I like how you usually would break it down, just like we got to quit using our timeline that literally a third you know, rebelled, and then now that this could still be going on. It could be, because we're not told That's that one-third re rebelled until Revelation 12, which is three and a half years left in the last seven years after Antichrist confirms the cover covenant that's talked about in that Daniel 9.27. And we're not even sure how many that is. We're told in Revelation and in Daniel that there's a hundred million angels, but there's other scripture and Bible that says they're uncountable. So we don't know how many, but if we use that example of a hundred million twice, by the time of the last seven years at the three and a half year point, fully one third have rebelled. So that means that they could have continued to rebel and are still rebelling, but that, we're not given the detail on it. Does it talk about that a little bit in Peter, where the pe where the um, the angels took different places and forsake their own peoples? Yeah, I'm not sure quite what you're referring to there. Okay, I was think thinking that the angels took different places, position. Okay. Oh, well, are you talking maybe about Jude about they left their habitation? Yeah, that's what I was talking about. Is that yeah, referring? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that, I mean, and this Jude 1 6, uh, 2 Peter uh, 2, and 1 Peter 3 all have references to the crimes of the angels at, at the time before the flood. And in 1 Peter, Jesus is actually going down to speak to them while he's still in the grave because they're in the abyss. And But not all the angels are in the abyss. Only the ones who created the violations against creation and perhaps the most evil ones. And that would include angels, again, that would have done this after the flood 
or any time thereafter, if they violated those laws, they would go to the abyss. But that also means that not all the fallen angels are in the abyss. So there's lots of fallen angels that are still out there, and they still rule this world. I mean, as, as, as the Bible says, Satan is the prince of this world. And you have an angelic hierarchy that's very similar to the hierarchy of God in heaven that are ruling this world even to this day. So when you have the Council of Gods in Psalms 82 that is representing the 70 nations both before and after the flood that Deuteronomy 20, uh, 32 talks about, um, that... Each of those will have one God ruling those nations. Then you have a hierarchy that falls in again underneath that. And then that goes down to the demigods and the rule on earth. So if we understand all of that, we need to know that, you know, people out there need to know that whether or not you think they're good or you think they're bad, they're running this place until the end time. Yeah, and I was um, kind of going, this kind of springboard, kind of get to the next part, you know, because we want to kind of, out how your book fits into this i was because i like patterns kind of stick out to me you know because in the bible trinity is you know threes are you know are huge so you know with your second incursion is kind of we touched on a little bit you know antarctica what if like you said this is a repository this is the place these secret societies are building up you know there's obviously an end goal they're building up to something what if this is the in the end time there's a third incursion where they're setting up you know, every every science fiction movie has this thing where the bad guys are trying to hearken in the end time and they've got to have the sacrifice. What if these societies are doing this in the preparation for these angels to come in, do the thing, and hearken back in, you know, a next incursion of Nephilim into this world? Yeah, it's, it's something that we have to be open to. Uh, I think it's a distinct possibility. Uh, I do think we have the descendants of the Raphaim and the Nephilim that are still in power today. But Jesus was quite clear in giving his signs for his second coming and for the end time. And there's two overarching signs which we need to understand in its totality. One is the fig tree generation as to what generation that would happen in. And then the other one is it will be like the days of Noah. And it's not just the violence that took place with the giants destroying humankind, enslaving them, and warring with themselves. The whole earth had become corrupt. And that's the Hebrew word, Hebrew word shakaf. It had decayed. It had degraded. It had been violated. It had been changed. And that starts to introduce significant technology that was taking place there that we haven't touched on, but the whole world was, was able to change DNA to manipulate genomes. Kind of what we're looking at being able to do today, but we're not in the end time yet. So our knowledge hasn't caught up to what Enoch, son of Cain, had learned from his father that, and then put into the seven sacred sciences. Uh, that merged with the knowledge from the gods and what seems to be about the same time or just before uh, the creation of the giants in the sixth generation. And so uh, you have the days of Noah that we have to take account for. And those words are talking about everything that happened in the days of Noah. It's an overarching sign that you have to look back when Noah lived. And he lived 600 years before the flood and 350 years after the flood which would include Sodom, which would include the second incursion. It would include a lot of events. It would include Babel, which is, again, something that's a really interesting crossover uh, story in, in various cultures, including secret societies that I'm not going to go into right now. But Jesus was very specific using, even though we have a translation in Greek for the New Testament and Hebrew for the Old Testament that's translated into English, it's the exact same words that's used to describe in, in chapter 9 of Genesis, right at the end, I think it's uh, 29 or 30, but right at the, the last two verses in, in chapter 9, there it says the days of Noah were 600 years before the flood and 350 years afterwards. He's using the exact same words as the days of Noah. 
And we need to understand what yeah. happened both before and after the flood if we're going to understand the signs to the end time. And that included in both before and after the flood, the creation of giants. So that's why I think we have to be open to the idea that when we start to see uh, more visibility from the fallen angels or the gods of, of old, and after Revelation 9, it, where you have the abyss open, where you have Abaddon, Apollyon, which I think is Azazel, as the king of the abyss coming out, they're mm -hmm. going to do what they did before. And they have nothing to lose, and neither do the rest of the angels if they think this is the last battle and they actually think they're either going to win or they're going to lose, but either way, they have nothing to lose. That's, yeah. No, I, I, there, well, I, I can't wait to finish the book. You know, I said it's already through because, as like I said, there's, when we have you on, I'm going to have so many other questions for you, too. Is um, there, you know, I just, and that's kind of as we go through this part, it's, you know, I mean, I don't know how, I said it's, it's, in a way, it's overwhelming trying to, you know, fit your 23 years of research and stuff into this book into, a, into an hour and a half thing. I would just, because there's so many questions. I mean, I always, I was going through this whole list of how I wanted to do it. I, I just because you, there was stuff you brought up, like, you know, as you went through the table of nations, you know, the 10 Nephilim kings um, in, oh, there's, I want to say, was it the 10 metallic? Is that, was it, am I getting that correct? The metallic dynasties, metallic dynasties, and I, yep, I want to ask seven. you: Does that does that correlate at all with the statue that Nebuchadnezzar yes. made? Yes. Yeah, and so you've got predicted and understand. There's uh, two empires before that, uh, as you have the seven that make up the seven empires that Revelation 17 talks about. So in Daniel. Daniel 2 will talk about the, uh, the statue that has the head of gold and then, you know, which is Babylon and then you have Persia, which is silver and then you have Greece, which is bronze and then you have, you know, the two legs, which are uh, Roman is iron and then you have the ten, the two feet of ten toes, which is the, the, the last empire. So if you count that up, you've got, you know, five. Uh, you've got four plus two before, which I think is either going to be uh, Egypt and uh, Assyria oh. or perhaps uh, Babel. I mean, pick your poison, Assyria, Babel, they're, they're, they come from the same roots out of Shinar or Sumer. So because Shinar is a transliteration for Sumer in, in the Bible. And then the last one is, is the Ten King Empire. Just like you had 10 kings in the Atlantean Empire, which is why you have the New Atlantis written by Francis Bacon talking about the religion, mm -hmm. which is Gnosticism, which creates theosophy to be the bridge for science and religion for the end time. And you have these 10 kings, just as you have the Club of Rome created in the 60s, um, who, you know, there's two different sections. So depending on who you want to place them in as to the reporting to, to either the committee of 300 or to the upper half of the Rosicrucians, which are all pure bloods from their higher and from the royal bloodlines, they have established the world into 10 empires. And that's what's coming. And that's 10 trading blocks, 10 groups of empires, 10 spheres of influence, however that you want to phrase that, that's that new world order that I like to call the new, not the new world order, but the Nephilim world order, just as sort of a sarcastic oh, joke, yeah. uh, <laughs> that they're trying to put into place, right? But it's going to take the universal yeah. religion to make that happen first. So people tend to get ahead of the things that have to be put in place first. And that's the new Babylon that the Templars were trying to put in place when they were in control from the inside of, of uh, Roman Catholicism. And the Jesuits were created afterwards as the new Templars to recreate because they need to have Gnosticism or polytheism that's going to unite because Gnosticism is the putting together of all of the religions around the world. But there's one root religion in the antediluvian world. That's Enochian mysticism that Enoch, son of Cain, creates. And so they're trying to put that back, put that back in the box and put all of the religions under that one universal religion. And to do that, they need to get control of the Vatican. And of course, we have a Jesuit that's controlling <laughs> the Vatican today yeah. who's making significant changes and moving things along. But we need to see that first before that 
10 nation empire comes along because they're the ones who that will create it and the kings will be answering to Babylon of the end time until they overthrow Babylon. And then uh, real quick, like I said, because I want you to get, you know, a little bit into like some of the secret societies that I'm um, parting here too. It's one of the things, you know, my fascination with the Nephilim is as you go through, like you, you talked about, you know, different cultures, they all have the same thing. They have the winged, fe you know, feathered creatures, yep. the serpent, you know, the seraphim. And you see these, I'm going to, I'm going to put up a couple of um, images here real quick for people too, because you have, you like right here, this is this is off of your website, you know, one of the pictures of the giants, you know, that breaks down, you know, just the size is, yep. that yeah, that some of these could be to where you have, you know, potentially up to a 36, you know, to 40 foot tall giant, which would in the next one, this is where this image, these yep. things start to make sense. Yep. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> and people rationalize these things away. But these are monstrous constructions and done with a technology we can't do today. And that goes back but, to the pyramids. Now, think about it too, because no, nothing can be explained. Now you have that. Wow, well, I didn't think about that. You have a, four, you have a forty foot, um, you, know, <laughs> you forty foot tall people. And it's like, what's what's a one ton block of you know yeah. marble and granite to hoist up? Yeah, that's yeah. <laughs> and we we don't get accounts of you know forty or fifty foot giants after the flood. Um, we don't know how big those giants were created in the first creation. And somehow there's a difference between Raphaim and Nephilim because they're called differently. And Nephilim only shows up three times in the Bible and all the other references to giants go back to Rapha and the I am for the male plural again. So there's a distinction there. So I don't think they were as big or as powerful as the original Nephilim before the flood. We get a reference in Amos that the Amorites, which would be a hybrid human Rephaim branch, one of those uh, groups of nations listed in the Bible under Canaan as the patriarch with Seth and Heth, who creates the uh, Sidonians and the Hittites. But then you get this patriarchalist list that includes the Amorites, the Jebusites, and all these other names, I won't go through every one of them, but they're the families of Canaanites and they don't have a patriarch, but all the nations have a patriarch. So why don't these? That's because they married daughters out of, from Canaan, Heth, and Sidon would have married into a Rephaim. So you would have had a Rephaim patriarch that created a smaller form of giant, which is recorded with the people who are taller in Numbers 13 than the Israelites. And then you have the Anakim, which are also Raphaim, as Deuteronomy 2 talks about, in Talmai, Seshai, and Ahiman as kings. So they were, there were two different sizes of giants after that. And the largest giant that we get a specification for, oh, I was going to, before I get into that, in Amos uh, chapter 2, it talks about, uh, the Amorites being like the cedars of Lebanon. They grew from 40 to 50 feet tall. They're the giant trees of the ancient world that were used for construction. But it's a simile. It's not a fact, right? And these are a hybrid human. But it's just to give that comparative that these were giants. Smaller than the Raphaim, but taller than the, than the humans. And Goliath, who's a giant, and is Rapha, Raphaim, uh, and one of, you know, four or five other brothers, um, who were rulers of the uh, Philistine Pentapolis, he was six cubits and a span. So an average cubit is 18 inches. That's a common cubit. But if he's a king, which I think he was, and of a, and a Gath in this case, and which is why David took five smooth stones to kill all five kings if he had to that day. Um, he wasn't that he was going to miss. Um, he was uh, six cubits and a span, but a royal cubit is closer to 21 inches. So that puts Goliath at somewhere between 9 feet 9 and 11 foot 3 inches, depending on the diameter. And Og's bed uh, is... Um, it was made of steel, right? Be, yeah, it was made of steel. It was 9 cubits. So it was somewhere between 15 and you know 14 and 16 feet tall, depending on the measurements. And Og, who's the last of the Raphaim, or last of the original Raphaim, because you still have Goliath and other giants that are still around even in Israel after August slain, you know, he would have been 
12 to 14 or 15 feet tall. And so before the flood, though, I think that's where we get these other ones. And in the book of Enoch, we don't get a good translation because we don't have the original Hebrew. We have the Aramaic version, which comes from the Dead Sea Scrolls area. And you have the Giaz version, which is the Ethiopian version. Both were translated out of Greek. And you get one as an L of 300 Ls and one as cubit. Um, well, if it's a cubit, that means they're like 500 feet tall. I don't think so. The, the Giaz version uses yeah. L's, uh, and we don't know what that length is. But I think from the description of these giants that we get from around the world, 40 to 50 feet tall tends to be a consensus from all of that other information that would tell us how big they are. But they just weren't tall. They were like muscular WWF wrestlers. They had a... Uh, Height, the width span, that was two to one, as opposed to human, which is three to one. So they're 50% wider. God. And they were fleet foot. What were they and eating? To, my God. Sna well, they, they used to enslave people. Yeah, they used to enslave people to gather food for them. Oh and my when they God. weren't gathering enough food for them, then they Eat ate them. their servants. Oh, my God. <laughs> You come here. It's <laughs> incredible. Uh, yeah, it is. You, you and now, see. And, and now, and now put um, a serpent face on them, or a lion face, or a bird face, hmm. or a dog face on it. All different kinds of Nephilim coming from different kinds of gods, right? Um, again, another rabbit hole, but understand there's more. But the serpent one is the one that is the most common and was running uh, the, the kingships, give them a longer neck, because an ak means long neck. Just as og goes back to long neck. So these Rephaim had long necks, just as uh, the uh, original Nephilim did, which is part of that serpentine look. Give them protruded chins, high cheekbones, large round wraparound snake eyes, and mm. that elongated skull, and now go Google a, a picture of Akhenaten, which would be, you know, at least a thousand years after the flood and 2000 years before the original creation of Nephilim. And you start to see that look as it's starting to dissipate as they're having to include marriages from humans to hmm. prevent blood diseases. Interesting. Yeah. But you still have that serpentine look. Yeah, I was, I was, I've seen, I can't find it. I was trying to find, there's like a chart, because this kind of breaks into, you know, you can go down so many different rabbit holes, like the aliens, yep. where they compare, like the different size of aliens, because you can go, you know, and this is where your belief, it could be God in heaven, this could be ancient aliens, this is where, you know, when all these different things come in, and that's where, but with these secret societies, kind of like with the chimera type thing, where you have all these things, is this kind of like they're in game? They're, they've got because I I don't I don't picture like there's these giants frozen there just waiting to come back, <laughs> or as their DNA like they're that this has they have these markers and they're waiting mm -hmm. to basically they're waiting for the right people to be there to re hearken in this era back and bring these yes these, the gods back. Yes, release the, the people out of the abyss and to bring about this um, day of destiny that they want to have. They want to have this rebellion. They want to win their freedom against uh, the evil god of the Bible as, as they portray him, the one who caused the flood and all the other things that um, are, are used to, to make that case. Now, I don't agree with that, but that's the case that's made. And that they know they can't defeat God. I don't think they ever thought they could, but they want their own realm, just as Satan did. As it's talked about in Isaiah 14, he wanted to be like God. He wants a realm like God and a world like God. That's what I think that they were, were actually after, because they know how powerful God is. So if, if, if God is the omnipotent God and the most powerful being, and they rebelled, they knew they couldn't defeat him, but they were trying to win a place that they could have on their own, just as portrayed, and I think you get a lot of these concepts portrayed in science fiction and hero 
uh, movies and horror movies, and I'm talking about Doctor Strange, though, which was out with a couple of movies, and they want to negotiate and have that realm. They want to fight, and that's why they need to develop the technology again. If they're going to convince humans to fight alongside with them against God and his angels, they're going to have to bring humans up to that level of technology and give them weaponry and DNA technology to create these biological weapons that you see described in Revelation 9 and Joel 1 and 2 for the war that happens just before the midpoint of the last seven years. Those aren't uh, allegories and those aren't um, you know, helicopters and things. You've got things coming out of the abyss that are probably the, the Akraba Baloo or the Gerda Baloo out of Sumeria were, were beings created by Tiamat, who we talked about earlier, who had were part of a creation of gods to keep those lower gods in line, which, of course, they were overthrown anyways by the lower gods as we talked. And they look oh, yeah. identical to the description provided in Revelation 9, and then those creatures in the war, of the 200 million man war that's in chapter 9 as well, they have descriptions of beings that aren't these scorpion beings, but are kind of similar, you know, human heads, horses' bodies, things like that. I think this is the biological weaponry that's being developed that's going to be put in place so that they have that type of weaponry, and then they have all of these angelic weapons that would have been used, let's say, in the Vedas or the Upanishads in those wars uh, against the gods that were nuclear and greater type of weapons that probably destroyed the earth in its hmm. first creation. But as no, I said, it, that's another rabbit hole. <laughs> no, that was kind of one of the stories. Like I, I always kind of talk, joke about, it's like when I was going through the thing, it's like, here's the devil tempting Jesus out in the desert. I've always like, this is like my son coming to me, Dad, I'm going to let you have this part of the house. <laughs> just let me do this. You're like, wait, I, I own this house. I go, I don't understand yeah. what you're doing here. But no, if you let yeah. me do my thing, you let me control this. If you bow to me, you know, do like, I will let you, yep. this this will all be yours. It, it already is. Mine. <laughs> uh, I, I don't get this. <laughs> well, if, if, you, if you look at it that angels are spirit beings, coming from a spirit realm, and that they have changeling qualities, that they need to take a physical form to interact physically in the world, which is what they would have done to create the original giants. So uh, as in Jude that we talked about, they left their habitat, which is the Greek word oiketarian, which means a dwelling place for the spirit. They left that, and they need a dwelling place for the spirit in this world, and that's the body and the soul and the spirit merges with that body and the soul. And so if we if we look at that, and then we look at that it's the world, as the Bible teaches us, that it has all of this corruption and sin in it, and I won't go into the detail as to how that sin comes about, but it corrupts the physical body. And I think that was part of what uh, made the original uh, watchers, seraphim angels, gods start off low well and good, but the physical world, if you're doing evil in it, it creates corruption and it will corrupt you as well. And I think that's one of the reasons why they rebelled. And then you have Jesus after fasting for 40 days in, you know, the word implanted into this dwelling place for his spirit, as the story goes in the Bible, subject to every aspect of the physical world in terms of its influence, fasting for 40 days and 40 nights, very physically weak at that point in time, that's when Satan comes and is going to try and tempt him. And we know how powerful and awful the world can be. Even when Jesus is on the cross, he's yelling out, have you forsaken me? I mean, and he knew what he was going there for. I mean, the world is, it has the ability to affect spiritual beings taking a physical form in this world. I'm picturing Survivor right now, Jeff Probst coming up and just saying, you know, it's like you're starving. How about this pizza, pizza? All you have to do is just say, I'm the thing. Pizza. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. It's just, it, 
you just see some of these stories as I'm growing up reading these things. I'm just like, man, I just, I don't understand. You know, you have these, these probably, but before we run out of time here, I want to, one last thing. So do you envision, you know, I, everybody's, you know, you know, okay, you got to tell me, when is this occurring? Is this, are we, are we talking next year? Are we talking two years? I mean, nobody knows, but do you, nobody knows. Do you feel like the ball is, you know that the the thing it's it's in play now. Like sure. there's things are starting to go in motion. Yeah, I think that's a very very good question, and I don't avoid the question. I mean, I don't set dates because I think uh, nobody knows exactly. What we do know is from the signs is that there's a big regeneration. We don't know whether that's 70 years or it's 120 years, but mm -hmm. I think it starts with the taking of Jerusalem in 1967. That's my speculation. Because most prophecy in the Bible, Old and New Testament, has to have Jerusalem in the possession of Judah who returns to the promised land for the end time to happen. So if that's the indeed the start of the fig tree generation, then 70 to 120 years. That could be anywhere from, you know, 2037 to, you know, do the math, right? So... Where we are, though, is I think we're in that fig tree generation and in the birth pangs that Jesus is talking about, where you have earthquakes, pestilence, pandemic, and wars and rumors of wars. And that's the coming of sorrows. That's the birth pangs. And they'll get probably more in intensity as we understand the allegory coming out of the Old Testament where those words are used, it's because I define everything within the Bible and quicker in between the birth bangs. So they're getting stronger. So we're still in that birth bangs. I mean, we're getting more earthquakes, but nothing to the level of revelations yet. We've had a few pandemics, probably the largest scare now is the COVID one, but there's more coming. They're gonna wow. get stronger. So by the time you get into the seals opening, you have 25% of the world that's going to be killed and the world being destroyed with these birth bangs. So that's the level that they're going to get to, to get into the last seven years. And the seals will open just before the last seven years, as, as my understanding of prophecy goes. And it doesn't stop there. The birth pangs increase throughout Revelation because it's a chronological story as well, just as all of the Bible has a beginning and end. It starts in Genesis, it ends in Revelation. Revelation is, uh, uh, has that same sort of chronology, just that you get some of the details that come after, but Revelation 14 gives you the summary for the last three and a half years. So Revelation 14 is essentially the midpoint of the last seven years, you get the summary, then you get the details of what it just summarized in, in, in 15 through 19. But where I'm going with this is that the trumpets come towards the midpoint, that's 33%. So increasing wow. pandemics, increasing earthquakes, it's this, and it's the same catastrophes that are listed in the birth pangs as what happens in the seals, trumpets, and bowls. And then the bowls would be 100% destruction, if wow. not for Jesus sure. coming back and short shortening the days. And sure. Wow, oh, God. That, that's what's yeah, scary. Sorry. You know, we're For trying sure. to wrap it up, but like just this year alone, we had almost a war, fires constantly. We have a pandemic, earthquakes, uh, hurricane season has been effing crazy, and that's scary. <laughs> and and one that's nothing. Alone, you know, that's and, nothing of what's coming. God. And, yeah, he's and he's predicting around 2037, so that means I may not get to retire. <laughs> He's not saying a date. He's saying possible. Well, I wasn't predicting. I just put seventy on to nineteen sixty-seven. So I think it. I think it's more likely seventy years is the window. But right. we have a lot of things to put in place yet. We can't get ahead of where where we're at. And everybody who's predicted has been wrong. So, you know, it's a bad thing to put a date on it. But, uh, you know, we have to have the universal religion show up, and it hasn't quite shown up. But I keep an eye on the Mary cult that's in Catholicism that uh, has, uh, you know, certainly the current Pope's full attention and support of. And you've got the prophecies of Lords and Fatima. And then you've got the six initiates 
the children of Medjugorje that were initiated that are coming out with a certain date to have the world convert to this religion that the Jesuits are working to make Catholicism in just in case people forgot that, that they want to turn it into a Gnostic religion for the end time. And, and the Gnostics are, you know, that's the root of the creation of the Jes Jesuits and the secret societies. They have a certain date to come out, say to the world, convert, or this is going to happen. They'll have 10 prophecies of escalating prophecies that will seem like the end time to get people to convert. So we haven't seen the false prophets show up yet. So, yep. Well, if, if that's something that you're willing to, what we do is, because we got here, um, if we get you back in for another thing, we could kind of take it up there. We'll have, we'll yep. start kind of back in that scenario. We'll go there and we'll continue on up to where you think that, you know, they're positioning, how they're trying to position their chessboard to get themselves yep. in the position. And, and so I'll be in touch. I'll send you an email and we'll see when we can, the sooner, what the soonest time is, we can get you back on and get yep. you back in here and we'll continue on that. Um, but yep. everybody, Genesis6conspiracy.com. Go click. Don't make the mistake I did. Go to him first before you go to Amazon and get that signed copy of this book. It, it, it'll be a lot cooler on your shelf than my my boring, just plain old, you know, Amazon copy. I won't have the cool signature to go with it. But Ed, this, if you're into giants, if you're into myth, the mythical creatures, if you know anybody that's read the Bible, done it, been in church, and you've always wondered about these things, this is not only is an amazing thing, it's also a really cool just companion to, you know, to answer some of these questions. It's like, if you have these things and go support, please support him, go to his books, you know, check him out. And, you know, he's, and Gary, you've said many times, if there's have others, if you have other questions, contact me and I can get you information. Yep. yep. If you want information on some of the topics that um, I've talked about today, I just name the topic. If I've got a PDF on it, I will send it to you. And I have a lot of PDFs, so I send out a lot of information. <laughs> That's cool. And, you know, particularly when I was talking about different kinds of Nephilim and stuff like that, I'm not making this stuff up. And I've got the footnotes oh, no. on the, on the uh, PDFs for the people if they want it. If they go to the website, they'll get a generous excerpt of all 98 chapters. So yes. you'll get a good feel for the chapter headings. And there's a lot of really interesting chapter headings on there and a good feel for what's in the book. Um, but as much as is on there for those generous excerpts, it's nothing to the information that's in the rest of the book. Now, is there any regret that you didn't get to 100, that you just stopped at 98? Well, technically there is 100, because I have a, have a epilogue okay. and a prologue. Okay. 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 <laughs> okay, we made it, we made it. All right. <laughs> I'm saying he made 800. He had what, 1300? You said you, yeah. you knocked out like yeah. 500. Oh my god! <laughs> well, Gary, thank you so much for taking the time out of your evening to come on and be yeah. with be with us. This was an amazing discussion. I really appreciate it. You you have I don't even know how you keep all that information up, upstairs, sir. I, 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 I just, yeah, I'm just I'm, I'm like sitting here. I'm looking at all over my notes, and it just it you just freeze. <laughs> Uh, it's just it's impressive yeah so like I well, said, i'm I, very impressed sir what i try what i try and do is is not give too much detail but to give people an understanding that this isn't just made up like there's sources for this and also in the book that people if you're not christian i let whether or not it's secular historians or uh, the different religions or secret societies i let them speak for themselves in the book I just present the information because I'm looking for the commonalities in terms of what's written elsewhere. So uh, I'll present both sides, but it's written with a Christian slant, no doubt about it. That's great. Well, thank, thank you very much. Really appreciate it. And uh, so I'll send you over that email and we're going to try to get you on as soon as possible so we can continue this discussion in part two. So I'm, I'm looking forward to that. So ha have a great night and we will talk soon. Thank you. Thank you. All right, everybody, this episode was brought to you by Brots Beard Care. Go to brotsbeardcare.com and enter promo code 3 beards. You're going to save 20% off your order. Nanny Cakes, Nancy Burke. Oh, that. go, oh that's, you're fine. You know, for, Nanny Cakes 407 or go to 407 923 2898. You're going to save 15% off your cake order here in the Central Florida area. Go to 3beardspodcast.com. Go to check us out on social media. 
you know, subscribe on YouTube, share this out, get the information out from Gary. He's a brilliant man. Um, I said that was a fantastic discussion. Everybody, thanks for watching. Um, stay tuned. We'll be coming back with our second show tonight. Everybody, thanks for watching. Appreciate it. Goodbye.